Imagine a jet so fast it could cross the United States in under 30 minutes. We're talking about the NASA X-43. At nearly 10 times the speed of sound, it broke records and redefined what an aircraft engine could be. To understand how it reached Mach 9.6, we need to look at the heart of this machine and the unconventional way it got there. Hypersonic flight starts at Mach 5. Above that, air behaves differently because compression, heating, and shock waves become extreme. Engineers at NASA knew no conventional turbojet or rocket engine could handle sustained flight at these speeds. The answer was the scramjet, short for supersonic combustion ramjet. Unlike normal jet engines, a scramjet has no moving parts. It uses the aircraft's own forward motion to compress incoming air before combustion. At hypersonic speeds, this means oxygen for burning fuel comes directly from the atmosphere, so there's no need to carry heavy oxidizers like a rocket does. But there was a catch. A scramjet can't operate from a standstill. It only works when you're already moving several times the speed of sound. That's why the X-43 wasn't just about building an engine. It was about designing an entire flight system that could get the engine into its operating range without tearing the aircraft apart. To give the scramjet a running start, NASA used a three-stage approach. First, a modified B-52 Stratofortress carried the X-43, attached to a Pegasus rocket booster, to an altitude of about 40,000 feet. Once in position, the B-52 released the Pegasus booster, which ignited and accelerated the combined assembly to around Mach 4-5. Only then could the X-43 separate and light its scramjet. This system was about speed and survival. Starting the scramjet in the lower atmosphere would have meant catastrophic heat and pressure loads before the craft was ready. By piggybacking on the B-52 and Pegasus, engineers could stage the flight in a safer, controlled environment, which was a concept borrowed from space plane programs, but refined for hypersonic research. Here's something to think about. Why couldn't NASA just build a scramjet that works from takeoff like a normal jet engine? Drop your thoughts in the comments and we'll reveal the answer at the end. The X-43 scramjet was deceptively simple on the outside, but a masterpiece of aerothermodynamics inside. Air entered through an inlet shaped to use shock waves to slow and compress it. But here's the trick. In a scramjet, the air stays supersonic even during combustion. This was the breakthrough that allowed the X-43 to go far beyond traditional ramjets which slow air to subsonic speeds inside the combustion chamber. The core was essentially a flow-through duct, inlet, combustor, nozzle. Hydrogen fuel was injected and mixed with the compressed supersonic air, igniting almost instantly. There was no time for mechanical compression. Everything depended on precision shaping of the engine's geometry and the physics of supersonic flow. At Mach 7 to 10, even small irregularities in airflow could cause a violent loss of combustion stability. That meant every millimeter of the inlet and combustor had to be tested and refined. Which raises the question, how do you keep fuel burning steadily in air rushing through at over 7,000 kilometers per hour? The answer lay in fuel choice and injection design. NASA used gaseous hydrogen, which is capable of igniting in milliseconds. It was injected into the supersonic airstream through carefully angled ports, creating rapid mixing. But here's the counterintuitive part. Engineers actually had to slow the air down slightly within the combustor to give the fuel time to mix and burn without letting it drop below supersonic speeds. Too slow and the engine would choke, too fast and the fuel would exit unburned. The scramjet's flame holders acted like miniature anchors for the combustion process. They kept the flame attached even as the air screamed past. This delicate balance of speed and fuel flow was the reason the X-43's engine could generate thrust in conditions that would destroy a conventional jet turbine in seconds. But as speed increased, another enemy emerged, heat. At Mach 9.6, the X-43's airframe and engine endured temperatures above 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. No pilot could survive such heat, so the craft was unmanned. For the scramjet, extreme heat threatened both structure and airflow stability. The answer lay in thermal-resistant materials and passive cooling. Carbon composites and high-temperature alloys protected critical zones, while hydrogen fuel was routed along engine walls before injection, cooling the structure and preheating the fuel for efficient combustion. Heat management was vital. 
In hypersonic flight, sudden spikes could warp materials and disrupt airflow. Every engine component had to withstand re-entry-like conditions while maintaining peak performance. But even with cooling solved, controlling the craft when the engine was producing such immense thrust was another problem. At hypersonic speeds, even tiny control surface movements can drastically alter flight path. The X-43's digital control system linked flight controls with the scramjet's fuel and inlet settings. Sensors tracked speed, pressure, and temperature hundreds of times per second, feeding algorithms that adjusted fuel flow and airflow instantly. The inlet's design included components that reacted to changing conditions to keep supersonic airflow stable. Engine and controls worked as one, preventing airflow disruptions, or unstarts, from turbulence or pilot input. This precise coordination was essential before NASA could test the X-43 in the extreme environment needed to prove its record-breaking capabilities. But before trusting the X-43 to break records, NASA had to test these systems in one of the harshest environments possible. Ground testing for a Mach 10 engine isn't straightforward. Wind tunnels capable of those speeds are expensive and run for only seconds at a time. NASA relied on both physical testing at facilities like Langley and Glenn and computational fluid dynamic simulations to refine the design. In 2004, the X-43A made history. Released from its Pegasus booster at Mach 7, it accelerated under scramjet power to Mach 9.6, around 11,850 km per hour over the Pacific. The burn lasted only about 10 seconds before the craft glided into the ocean, but it was enough to prove the concept. That flight didn't just set a record, it demonstrated that an air-breathing engine could function at speeds approaching orbital velocity. It also highlighted the enormous technical challenges of sustaining hypersonic flight, from thermal protection to flight control integration. And while the flights were short, the fuel system's role was no less critical. For the X-43 scramjet, hydrogen fuel had to be delivered with split-second precision. Too much in combustion could cause destructive pressure spikes. Too little in thrust would collapse. The fuel system doubled as part of the cooling architecture, it circulated fuel along engine walls before injection. This dual role required ultra-precise pumps and regulators, all designed to operate flawlessly in a high-vibration, high-temperature environment. Because hydrogen is stored at extremely low temperatures, it also served as a thermal buffer against the heat generated during the flight sequence. Every part of the fuel system was tuned to match the engine's combustion profile, making it as much a part of the engine as the combustor itself. With fuel, airflow, and heat under control, the X-43 was ready to write its name in aerospace history, even if its operational life was brief. The NASA X-43 program proved that scramjets could work, and its data is still shaping hypersonic research today. Military and civilian programs exploring high-speed transport, spaceplane concepts, and long-range missiles have all drawn from the X-43's breakthroughs in inlet design, thermal protection, and fuel air mixing. Its record of Mach 9.6 for an air-breathing engine still stands. While the craft itself won't be replicated, the knowledge gained forms the foundation for future hypersonic vehicles. One day, flights between continents in under an hour may be possible thanks to lessons learned from this small, unmanned wedge of carbon and alloy that flew faster than any jet in history. So why couldn't NASA just build a scramjet that works from takeoff? The truth is, scramjets only operate efficiently when air is already moving through them at several times the speed of sound. At low speeds, they can't compress the air enough for combustion, so they need a booster to get them into their operating range. When the first Rafale streaked over Ladakh in 2020, their arrival sent a message across the border. India's air power had just changed. Fast, deadly, and built to dominate, it's the most advanced jet in the Indian Air Force. But how do you create a machine like this? Let's go inside its making, from the first bolt to the first mission. In the late 1970s and 1980s, Europe faced a dilemma. Air forces needed an aircraft that could do everything from air superiority, ground attack, reconnaissance to even nuclear deterrence. Instead of relying on multiple specialized jets, France wanted a single platform. Dassault Aviation took on the challenge. They began with prototypes like the Raphael A in 1986, a demonstrator that showcased cutting-edge aerodynamics and fly-by-wire controls. 
The Vision was a jet that could adapt instantly to any mission. India watched closely. For decades, its air force relied on a mix of Russian MiGs, French Mirages, and British Jaguars. By the 2000s, these fleets were aging. India needed a modern replacement that could dominate regional skies and face evolving threats. The Rafale was chosen after a long evaluation process known as the MMRCA deal beating rivals like the Eurofighter Typhoon and the F-A-18. But before it joined India's arsenal, the Rafale had to prove itself on the assembly line. That process begins with building the airframe itself. Unlike older jets built largely from aluminum, this aircraft relies heavily on advanced composites. Carbon fiber reinforced plastic makes up nearly 70% of its surface area. This ensures strength without unnecessary weight. Large panels are cured in high-pressure autoclaves, robotic arms trim and drill each panel with micron accuracy, and ultrasound scanners check for hidden flaws. Titanium is chosen for its resistance to heat and stress, and used for critical joints and engine housings. Computer-controlled jigs hold the fuselage, wings and tail in alignment, while laser trackers verify tolerances. Thousands of fasteners are installed by automated drills, while critical joints are laser welded to reduce weak points. By the time the bare airframe stands on its landing gear, it has already gone through thousands of quality checks. But a body alone can't survive. What gives the Rafale its reflexes is next. Modern fighter jets are inherently unstable. This is a deliberate move because it makes them more agile in combat. But it also means a human pilot alone cannot control the aircraft safely. This is where the Rafale's digital fly-by-wire system comes in. Cables are replaced with electronic signals. Pilot inputs are interpreted by quadruple redundant computers, which adjust control surfaces within milliseconds. The wiring harnesses inside the Rafale stretch for kilometers. Each is laid by hand, color-coded, and then tested for faults. These transmit signals from the cockpit to the wings faster than thought. It's this system that allows the Rafale to perform Cobra maneuvers and high-G rolls, all while keeping the pilot in control. Still, reflexes mean nothing without a heart powerful enough to rule the skies. No aircraft can dominate the skies without a powerful engine. For the Rafale, that role belongs to the Snecma M88 turbofan. Compact yet ferocious, each engine produces 50 kN of thrust dry and 75 kN with afterburner engaged. The M88's secret lies in its materials. Blades inside the turbine face temperatures beyond the melting point of metal, yet survive thanks to single crystal alloys and ceramic coatings. Some sections are cooled from within by air channels thinner than a human hair. Before an engine is fitted to a jet, it is tested in massive ground facilities. Flames roar out of the exhaust as engineers push it to its limits, running it for hours at full afterburner, with sudden throttle changes and simulated high altitude conditions. When finally installed, two M88s give the Rafael a top speed of Mach 1.8 and the ability to fly supersonic without afterburners for long durations. Engines bring raw strength, but the cockpit reveals how man and machine truly merge. Step inside the Rafael's cockpit and you find an environment designed for maximum awareness. The pilot sits on a Martin Baker ejection seat angled at 29 degrees to reduce G-force strain. In front, a wide-angle holographic head-up display projects critical information such as speed, altitude, and weapon status without forcing eyes off the sky. Three color touchscreens form the glass cockpit, customizable to the mission. Controls are placed on the throttle and stick in a system called Hands-On Throttle and Stick, which allows the pilot to manage radar, weapon, and navigation without looking down. The helmet itself is integrated with sensors, enabling the pilot to lock onto targets just by looking. This human-machine symbiosis is what transforms the Rafale from an aircraft into a lethal combat system. Inside, technology watches the sky, but radar and avionics give the Rafale its unseen advantage. The Rafale carries one of the most advanced radars in the world, the RBE-2AESA. This active electronically scanned array doesn't sweep mechanically. Instead, thousands of transmit and receive modules scan electronically at near instant speed. It can track multiple aircraft simultaneously, guide weapons and map terrain with photographic detail. Its low probability of intercept technology makes it nearly invisible to enemy detectors. 
Alongside radar, the Rafale integrates the Spectra Electronic Warfare Suite. This acts like an invisible shield by detecting enemy radars and launching decoys against missiles. Together, these systems give the Rafale unmatched situational awareness, allowing it to see first, shoot first, and survive longer. And with that advantage, the weapons it carries decide victory or defeat. A fighter jet is only as powerful as the weapons it carries. The raw fail can deploy more than 14 tons of payload across 14 hardpoints. Air-to-air -air combat is handled by missiles like the Meteor, capable of beyond visual range kills. For precision strikes, it carries laser-guided bombs, scalp cruise missiles, and even nuclear-capable ASMPA missiles for strategic deterrence. Every weapon must be electronically integrated into the jet. This involves months of testing software and aerodynamics and live firing exercises. Engineers track missile release, stability under shockwaves, and guidance under jamming. This flexibility is why the Rafale is called Omni-Roll. It can switch between bombing and reconnaissance in a single mission. But first, every Rafale must survive brutal trials. Once the jet is fully assembled with its airframe, engines, avionics, and weapons pylons, it moves to ground testing. Hydraulic systems are pressurized, electronics are scanned for faults, and fuel tanks are checked for leaks. Then comes taxi trials. The raw fail rolls down the runway at increasing speeds while engineers monitor sensors. Only after passing these tests does it take to the skies. Flight testing is where the jet proves itself. Test pilots push it into violent maneuvers and high G turns. Every vibration is logged, every heat spike recorded. If a system falters, the aircraft returns to the hangar for refinement. By the time a raw fail is delivered to the Indian Air Force, it has flown hundreds of test hours and cleared dozens of certifications. After proving itself, the jet begins a new chapter in India. For India, acquiring the Rafal was more than a purchase. It was a partnership. The deal included training, simulators, weapons, and technology transfer. Indian pilots trained in France before bringing the jets home, and Indian technicians learned to maintain and upgrade them. In 2020, the first batch landed at Ambala Air Base. Their arrival was broadcast nationwide, which symbolized not just new aircraft, but a leap in India's defense capability. Since then, Rafales have been deployed in Ladakh, near the Himalayan borders, and integrated into nuclear deterrence missions. Their presence has shifted regional air power equations significantly. Beyond strategy and strength, the Rafale shows a personality unlike any other. Like every great machine, the Rafale has quirks. Pilots praise its smooth handling, precise controls, and wide visibility. They often describe it not just as powerful, but as graceful. It can climb steeply, bank sharply, and then settle into cruise with elegance. This balance of agility and stability makes it as much an art form as a weapon. And that unique spirit brings us to one final thought. The Rafale is more than an aircraft. It is the story of engineering brilliance meeting national defense and of precision craftsmanship becoming a shield in the skies. If you enjoyed exploring how the Rafael is made and why it has become the pride of the Indian Air Force, make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell icon so you never miss more deep dives into the world of advanced technology.